assalamu alaikum today we're going to start a very interesting concept which is generally taught in a very boring manner and that is the concept of dc current electric current now what i would like to emphasize is first of all i think that no scientist no electrical engineer no physicist could consider himself or herself complete without a proper understanding of electricity the electric current that drives our civilization so if you know that if you think that you know how an electric current flows through a wire probably you are mistaken and this is something we'll learn as we go through this class today so it's important that you take good notes for especially for today's lecture the reason is that i'm going to cover this topic in a very unconventional fashion and this is not the narrative that you'll find in your textbook in fact almost 95% of the textbooks that are written do not follow this narrative so i'm giving i'm going to give you a very insightful a very wisdom oriented approach to understanding electric current okay so take good notes you will not find this material in your textbook or in most other textbooks that you will encounter in your lives okay so it's a new approach of looking at electric currents and this connects electric currents with electric fields and charges all right so let's start our discussion so what i'm going to talk about today is one kind of electric current which is dc current Di dc or direct current first of all i would like to start off with a simple definition of electric current i will not say dc again and again whenever i say current at this point in time i mean direct current all right suppose i have a wire it's a cylindrical wire of uniform cross section the cross section of course is a circle and inside this wire i draw a circle a hypothetical circle which only exists in my imagination and if i have some charge carriers say i assume that my charge carriers are positive if i focus on this hypothetical plane and there's an observer sitting on this plane and what this observer is observing is the number of charge carriers that are passing this plane per unit time this is what the observer is measuring so these charge carriers are crossing this plane and of course they cross crossing this plane with a certain velocity and what this observer who is sitting here is measuring is that in a certain period of time delta t he observes that the total amount of charge net charge that has crossed this hypothetical plane is delta q so this ratio delta q over delta t is defined to be the current at this point at this plane now how big is this delta t this delta t could be very large it could be one second it could be really small it could be a nanosecond all right so what this quantity will give you is just an average value of the current okay so this is the average value of the current i average over a time delta t all right so it's very quite possible that if you have some device that is connected to this conductor and this device is measuring current let's call this device an ammeter and if you plot with time the current that is observed on this ammeter it's quite possible that a constant current is not observed rather the current fluctuates about a certain baseline 
it's possible that the ammeter gives you a current of this kind. So over a time interval delta t, if this is your delta t, you divide the total charge that has crossed this hypothetical plane in time delta t, you will get some value of current. And that will be the average of current over this interval. If you choose another delta t, perhaps a larger delta t, it's possible that the current that you measure is different. All right. I would like to start the class in time and end in time. If the class starts late, the class has to end late. And it also causes disturbance to the early comers. So please be in time for the class. So this value of the, the average current can change depending upon whether you're making a measurement here, whether you're making a measurement here, and the interval of time over which the current is being measured, over which the charge is being measured. So this is our definition of the average current over the time delta t. Now if I shrink this delta t, if this delta t goes smaller and smaller and smaller, then this ratio would turn into a derivative. Okay? So this ratio would become dq over dt. And this ratio gives me the instantaneous current at some point in time t. Okay? So this is my definition of instantaneous current. All right. Now, if a few, a few more definitions I would like to highlight. If I consider this piece of wire, it's a conductor. If my observer is here and I measure the current here, I get some value of current I1. If my observer is here, I measure some current, I obtain a value I2. At some other point, I measure a current, I obtain a value I3. So at different points inside the uh, conductor, I'm measuring different currents. If all of these currents are the same, then I would say that the current is uniform. So I've defined a uniform current. A uniform current means that all of these I's, I1, I2, I3, all of these are the same over the volume of the conductor. This is what is meant by a uniform current. The other thing I would like to highlight is that if I'm here at this point inside the conductor, I'm measuring the current which is I1. Now this current can be a function of time. The current can change with time. Okay? However, if this current does not change with time and the current does not change with time for all of these points inside the conductor then I would say that the current is steady. So I have introduced two terms a uniform current and a steady current. A steady current means that I nt is independent of time does not depend upon time. It's constant with time. So what I've done so far is that I've defined a current, I've defined a uniform current, and I've defined a steady current. All right. Now this is something that perhaps you already know from your O and A level, so things look easy so far. Okay, now I would like to talk about what are charge carriers. Suppose I have a beaker in which I place molten sodium chloride. Okay? So sodium chloride in liquid form. Now in liquid form this will comprise sodium ions and chloride ions. Okay? 
and if it's neutral it's the equal concentration of sodium ions and chloride ions now if I take a hypothetical boundary a hypothetical plane inside this bath of sodium chloride it's possible that the sodium ions are moving across this bath and so are the chloride ions so if sodium ions are moving to the right there is some potential gradient which somehow makes the sodium ions move from the left to the right and it makes the chloride ions move from the right to the left then if there is an observer sitting on this plane if the concentration of the sodium and the chloride ions is, is the same and the velocities of the sodium and chloride ions on average is the same then no current will be observed because this positive charge that is moving across this boundary from left to right and an equal amount of negative charge moving from right to left in the same period of time okay so this would require that the sodium and the chloride ions have the same velocities so no current will be observed so when we talk about dq over dt this q really means the net charge all right so you could have a current due to ions in ions and cations you could have a current due to electrons that are in vacuum for example this is what happens in uh, field emission or in uh, or in electric heaters perhaps so what I have is I have a voltage source and a resistive wire current flows through this wire this wire heats up and electrons are ejected from the surface of this wire these electrons enter free space this process is called do you know what this process is called? thermionic emission and if there is an electric field pointing in this direction these electrons will be accelerated they will experience a force because of the electric field and they will accelerate in this direction and if I have a hypothetical surface I count the number of electrons passing through this hypothetical surface per unit time then I can that <coughs> that ratio will actually be the current so now what I have is I have pretty free particles that constitute a current I can have ions that constitute a current I can have free particles, I can have protons <coughs> that constitute a current. Okay? In semiconductors, I have electrons and I can also have holes. In metals, the charge carriers are free electrons and we're going to talk about metals in, in a bit of detail. Alright? So, any questions up to this point? Alright, so now what I'm going to discuss is I'm going to talk about the relationship of current with velocity of the charge carriers. Suppose I'm sitting inside this conductor. Okay? and there are charge carriers moving from left to right and these charge carriers are positively charged remember conventionally the direction of the conventional current is taken to be the direction of the flow of positive charge now if I'm inside this conductor what I observe is that I have positive charges that are moving from left to right and I have a plane suppose the plane is now a, squ a square instead of a circle so this plane that I've drawn here instead of a circle now I've drawn a square of area capital A 
all right and now what i assume is that all of these positive charge carriers these mobile charge carriers all of them are moving with the same velocity okay so I, the velocity is a vector i draw a vector to represent the velocities since the velocity of all of these particles is the same and the velocity is denoted by v with the vector sign on top of it and all of these arrows are of the same length and they are pointing in the same direction so the current is uniform so i'm assuming a uniform current and i'm also assuming that this velocity does not change with time so i'm assuming a steady current okay. now each of these charge carriers holds a charge small q now i i want to observe the amount of charge that passes through this plane in a time interval delta t now if the current is uniform and it's steady okay then the current will not depend upon how big a delta t i choose okay because the current is just unchanging with respect to time a steady current on this graph will be represented by a straight line okay and it does not depend upon where you are measuring the current it will be the same here it will be the same here it will be the same here now my goal is to find the current due to this velocity now i would like to know how many charges flow cross this surface per unit time and another assumption that i have is that the velocity vectors all of them being parallel and each one of them is normal to the surface okay this is another assumption because i'm at liberty to choose whatever surface i like so i've chosen a surface that is normal to the velocity vectors of the individual charge carriers now if i would like to find out how much charge crosses this plane per unit time it's quite easy what i could do i could just make a cube i make a cube of a certain length which is v which is the velocity times delta t and i would know that all of the charge carriers that are present inside this volume will pass through this plane in a period of time equal to delta t okay so if i start my stopwatch at time t equal 0 then only the charge carriers that are next to this plane will pass through this plane just after the stopwatch has started and if i wait for a time delta t then i'm allowing the particles that are a distance v delta t away to reach the plane and cross it so what is going to effectively happen is that all the charge carriers within this cube of length v delta t and cross sectional area a are going to constitute a current okay so how would i calculate the current the current i passing through this area will equal the number of charge carriers that are inside this volume now how many charge carriers are inside this volume i would need to know what generally is the charge density how many charge carriers do i have in this material that are available to constitute a current per unit volume okay so this is the charge density i multiplied by the volume of this cube which is a v delta t okay and of course i have to find out the charge on each charge carrier which is q <coughs> all right any confusion up to this point g sorry nav this is the volume of this cube 
okay this is the number of carriers charge carriers per unit volume so nav will be the total number of charge carriers inside this volume each one of them carries a charge q okay so q n a v is the total amount of charge that passes through this surface area and i have to divide by delta t okay g a v delta t is the volume v delta t is the density sorry sorry i'm sorry जी एक बार फिर बता देता हूँ कोई बात नहीं सो आई वुड लाइक टू फाइंड आउट द टोटल अमाउंट ऑफ चार्ज दैट क्रॉसेस दिस प्लेन इन एन इंटरवल ऑफ टाइम दैट्स इक्वल टू डेल्टा टी कैन आई आस्क यू टू लीव द क्लास आप दोनों या तवज्जो दे मेरी तरफ अगर क्लास में आप बैठ, बैठना चाहते हैं और प्लीज बॉल पॉइंट्स को क्लिक ना करें सो द करंट इज डिफाइंड एज द टोटल अमाउंट ऑफ चार्ज दैट पासिस थ्रू दिस प्लेन इन एन इंटरवल ऑफ टाइम दैट्स इक्वल टू डेल्टा टी ओके okay? इधर देखो इधर देखो यार मैं वक्त देता हूं आपको सवाल पूछने का <laughs> अब टोटल चार्ज इस वॉल्यूम में कितना है वो है क्यू द चार्ज ऑन ईच चार्ज कैरियर्स आई हैव टू मल्टीप्लाई दिस बाय द नंबर ऑफ चार्ज कैरियर्स इनसाइड दिस क्यूब एंड व्हाट आर व्हाट्स द नंबर ऑफ चार्ज कैरियर्स आई टेक द नंबर ऑफ कैरियर्स पर यूनिट वॉल्यूम ओके which is called the carrier density it will change from material to material i will multiply it by the volume of this cube which is a times v times delta t so this will give me the total charge that passes through this area in a time interval delta t i divide this by the time interval delta t i will get the current so my current is going to be q times n a v All right. Okay. Will this current depend upon the size of the cube? Yes, because it depends upon a. If I choose a bigger cube, the current that is passing through a bigger cube will be larger because a is larger. However, if I take this a to the left hand side, I divide this i by a. i will get q which is the charge on each charge carrier into the carrier density into velocity of each charge carrier this quantity the current divided by the area over which this quantity is being measured is called the current density and it's denoted by j current density Okay. Now, is Q a vector? No, it's a scalar. It's just a number. N is just a scalar. V is a velocity vector. So this J is also a vector. So I can also put a vector sign on top of J. The current density becomes a vector, and it's equal to Q times the carrier density into the velocity V. All right. Now, <clears throat> one simple example of how you could calculate n. For example, consider copper, or let's consider probably sodium. Now, sodium has an atomic number eleven and a mass number of twenty-three. When we discuss metals in 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 a while. we'll figure out that each sodium atom contributes a single electron which becomes mobile 
Now, if you know the density of sodium, which means you know the number of atoms per unit volume, you can calculate how many charge carriers exist per unit volume. Okay? So, N is quite simple to calculate, especially for elements. It's difficult for semiconductors, but for metals, which contribute free electrons from the atom, it's quite easy to calculate. In any case, if you know the charge on each charge carrier, and you know the carrier densities, you multiply it by the velocity vector of each charge carrier, you'll get the current density. Now, this current density is a vector. Okay? Now, consider the same example here. If I were to break up this big area into small patches, I have a small patch here. I call this area DA and since this small area is also a vector, we have been talking about area vectors, I can put a vector sign on top of this. This becomes DA vector, a vector DA and it's pointing, this area vector is pointing in a certain direction. Suppose it's pointing out of the cube. Now it's very possible that I know the current density at precisely this point J. So if I take the dot product of J with this dA, I can find the infinitesimal amount of current that is passing through this area. So my current at any point I, any point, and the small amount of current dI can be calculated by taking the dot product of J with DA. Now this definition allows for non-uniform currents. Suppose I have a situation in which there are more charge carriers flowing through the center of this conductor and per unit time and fewer charge carriers flowing through the outer edges of this conductor per unit time. So the current is heavier, is bigger in the center of this conductor which means that the current is no longer uniform. It varies from point to point inside the conductor. I can have situations like this. So what I could do in that case, I could take the dot product of the current density at any point with the local area vector. I will get the small amount of current that is passing through the small patch. And if I would like to calculate the total current that is passing through this surface area, I would just take the integral I equals the integral of di which is just the integral of j dotted with da okay for example aapko sawal puchna tha All right. <clears throat> Suppose I have a situation in which there are positive charge carriers, a uniform velocity, which means a uniform current. All of these velocity vectors are pointing in the same direction. Okay? So again, this is uniform current. However, my plane of observation is at a certain angle. Okay. If this plane of observation, I would like to calculate the current, the total charge that flows through this plane per unit time. Remember, it's a hypothetical plane. So if this plane is totally normal to the surface, all of the charge will flow through the plane. However, if this plane is oriented in a fashion such that the plane is parallel to the velocity vector, or in other words, the area of this plane, A, is normal to the velocity vector, there's actually no current flowing through this plane. So what I would really like to take is the dot product between the velocity vector and the area. Therefore, I have to take the area to be a vector. Okay? <clears throat> 
So if I take the area to be a vector, I can form the local dot product of the local area, the small amount of area with the current density at that point, which can be different from point to point. And I can calculate the small amount of current, di, that passes through a small patch. Okay, so this definition allows one to calculate the current when the current is non-uniform. It also allows you to calculate the current when the current is uniform because if the current is uniform, the current density is uniform. You can just take this outside the integral. Okay? And then you can form the product J dotted with dA. And if the two are parallel, if J and dA are always parallel, you can call this to be G dot, J dot A. And J is simply Q, N, V, you multiply this straight away with A. Now you'll get plenty of practice of this kind in the tutorials and the recitations. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, uh, this dot product may give us a negative or a positive answer, right? It's, it's a dot product at the end of the day. Right. So, but when we define so this and this current could also this q could also be positive and negative so you just have to con be consistent and think what kind of charge carriers you have what kind of area you have and you have to define a general positive direction and a general negative direction okay you just think about this intuitively or using some common sensical rules okay okay Now comes the really interesting part. What we would like to see is what is happening inside a metal. Now most of the conductors that we come across, they are metals. Okay, All the connecting wires that we make, they are either metals or alloys. Okay, Copper, sodium, we can't make sodium as conductors because sodium is volatile, it will immediately react with oxygen or moisture in the air, but we can have copper, gold interconnects, aluminum and so on. So generally when we're talking about conductors, it's easier to consider metals. Now what happens in metals is, the metals you know are the group 1 element or the group 2 elements, generally the group 1 elements, for example sodium, lithium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium, or the group 2 elements, or the noble elements. So what happens in metals is, if you look inside a metal, and you take a microscopic view, you have a piece of metal, and microscopically, there are positively charged cores. And this positively charged core comprises the nucleus and some of the electrons inside the atom. For example, if you're talking about sodium, the atomic number is 11 and the electronic configuration 1s2, uh, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So this electron this 3s1 electron, the 3s electron can easily go out of the atom. So if you put sodium atoms together, the sodium atoms will interact and enough energy will be provided to this 3s electron so that it can come out of the atom. This process is called ionization. So each of the sodium atoms, and you know how many of them are per unit volume? Because you know the molar density of sodium and you know the density of sodium. You can tell how many of these ions are present per unit volume. This is something that's easy to calculate. You learn this in your basic chemistry. However, what's happening is that each of this atom is ionized. So these are not really atoms, these are just ions. And so each of these symbols, the plus symbol, represents this, this core. I call this the positively charged core. So each of these ions is actually representing 11 protons, 
and 10 electrons. Okay, so the electronic configuration, it's isoelectronic with the argon atom. Okay, which has 10 electrons. So each of these cores is positively charged, but the metal as a whole is neutral. So the ionized electrons, they are free to wander around inside the metal. The positively charged cores are fixed in position because of the crystal structure of the sodium, uh, of the sodium metal. It has a certain crystal structure. It could be face centered cubic. It's a cubic structure. The sodium ions are arranged in the form of a cube. So the ions are fixed in position more or less and they can only vibrate about their mean positions because of temperature effects. But to zeroth order they are fixed in position. And the electrons that have been donated or the electrons that come out of the ionization process, they no longer belong to any sodium atom. They are free to wander inside this medium. So what we really have is that we have positively charged ions and a soup of electrons. These electrons are everywhere and they don't belong to any atom. Okay? Sometimes this soup of electrons is called the sea of electrons. Sometimes these are electrons that are called conduction electrons because they contribute to conduction inside the metal. If you take a piece of metal in which there are n atoms, there will be n cores and there will be n free electrons. They are also called free electrons. <coughs> so these are the free electrons that contribute to conduction inside metals. They are the mobile charge carriers. Okay, so this is the picture of a metal, the microscopic view of a metal when it is placed inside zero electric field. There is no electric field that is imposed on this metal. This is what the native state of the metal is. Okay, now are these free electrons, if you just pick up a single electron, let me just focus on a single electron out of curiosity, even though it is not possible from quantum mechanical principles to talk about a single electron because the wave function is just, uh, it's diffuse. However, for the sake of argument, let's focus our attention on a single electron. Now, is this electron static with time? Does it change its position? Why does it change its position? Because it's free to go around. Now, what determines the velocity of this electron? If it's changing its position, it's moving with a certain velocity. Okay. The first question is that this electron, if it's really free, what is the potential energy of this electron? Zero. Because it's a free electron. If it's really free, its potential energy has to be zero. So it's not under the influence of any electric field. The positive charges, the cores, one might argue, impose a field at the location of this electron but that field is zero because these positive charges are everywhere if this positive charge is, is attracting the electron then there are other positive charges all around this electron that are attracting the electron in opposite directions so the net force that this particle sees is zero and if the force is zero then the potential energy is zero because electric forces are conservative you already know that F equals minus du dx. So this electron is not experiencing any force. If it's not experiencing any force, is it accelerating? No. But that doesn't stop it from having any velocity. It can have a uniform velocity. Now what is that velocity? Is it 1 meter per second? It is 100 meters per second? Is it close to the speed of light? What is this velocity? What gives you the handle to determine this velocity? What would it depend upon? Any idea? You've taken a whole course on modern physics. Any idea? You've studied statistical mechanics or thermodynamics. Any idea what this velocity would depend upon? On the temperature. Higher the temperature, one would expect higher velocities. So if I know the temperature capital T, the absolute temperature, can I predict what the average velocity is going to be? Yes. 
first of all if I increase the temperature what's going to happen to this velocity of the free electron it's going to increase can you give me a rough estimate or a quantitative measure of what how can I calculate this velocity suppose that this sea of electrons is a just a gas of molecules or or a gas of the noble atom argon atoms that are free to move around a noble gas or an ideal gas so these free electrons are behaving exactly in the same fashion to first order as a, as a, as a gas of non interacting particles higher the temperature higher would be the average velocity one can determine what this velocity is kaise if i know the temperature is there a way of determining or estimating what the average velocity is going to be ji bilkul exactly the average thermal energy is 3 by 2 into the boltzmann constant into the absolute temperature and this would give us the kinetic energy of the electron half m v average squared okay because the electron can move in the x direction it can move in the y direction it can move in the z direction so there are 3 degrees of freedom each degree of freedom has an average energy half kt so 3 degrees of freedom will have an average energy 3 by 2 times kt so this is the average energy of a single electron and all of this energy is kinetic because there is no potential energy from this relationship you can estimate what v average is going to be okay so my v average is equal to 3 times kb t over the mass of the electron under root all right so if i have a temperature of 300 kelvins which is room temperature i put in the mass of the electron i put in the the boltzmann constant this turns out to be about 10 raised power 6 meters per second which is 1 percent of the speed of light so each electron at room temperature inside the metal is moving with a horrendously high velocity which is 1 percent of the speed of light it is a really big velocity in 1 second it is covering 1000 kilometers this is a really high velocity for the electron okay but does this high velocity constitute a current inside this metal no it doesn't why because because the directions are totally random if i draw a hypothetical surface inside this metal even though the electrons they are moving at really high velocities per unit time the average number of electrons going from left to right across this surface is equal to the average number of electrons going from right to left because the velocities even though they are really high they are in totally random directions just like an ideal gas the molecules are moving at some velocity with but in random directions that's why these high velocities will not constitute a current even though the velocities are really high because in 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 currents you have to talk about the total net charge that crosses a unit area per unit time and that's zero in this case because the velocities are pointing in random directions so even though these velocities are really high what's happening here is that they don't form a current hello i really need to ramp up this voice a little bit okay theek hai ye baat ji 
if I focus on this electron, if I focus on this electron, excuse me, just. Hello. It happens that I have problems speaking too loud. All right. If I just focus on this electron, what's happening to this electron? This electron is moving with a really high velocity. This is the velocity vector, but it's colliding with the atomic cores. So there is a there is a collision between this electron and the ionic core. When there is a collusion between a light electron and a massive object, what happens to the light object? It just rebounds in a certain direction. Okay? So that direction could be really any direction. It could rebound in any direction because the electron is so small the nucleus or the ionic core is so big the electron strikes the ionic core it can reflect in any direction so at each point a collision results <coughs> there are collisions happening all the way so if I just focus my attention on a single electron and I draw the velocity vectors for this single electron so I'm talking about one electron there's a velocity vector it changes its position. This is the trajectory of the electron. After a certain period of time, it changes its direction because it has made a collision. After a certain period of time, it changes its direction again. It's well nigh possible that it makes a longer trajectory before it sees the next collision. So, after it sees a collision, it makes a change in its trajectory again. And it's possible that it sees another ionic core earlier this time. So it keeps on changing its positions. And if you look at the trajectory of this electron, it's just meandering about a, uh, an initial position. But it's actually going away from the initial position with time. But this is what the trajectory of this single electron will look like per unit time. Now, if you take all of these velocity vectors for the single electron, and take the average of these vectors, what do you expect to get? Zero. Correct? So this is an average over time. So over time, you're focusing your attention on a single electron. Over time, the velocity of that electron is zero. Because of collusions, the electron is rapidly changing its trajectories. And the time between two successive collusions is not the same. The collusions can happen, the, the intercollusion time differences could be T1, T2, T3 and so on. These times are not the same. It's a totally random event. The electron can see a collusion after a nanosecond. The next collusion it can see after 1.5 nanoseconds. The third collusion it can see after an interval of 0.6 nanoseconds. The next collusion it can see after 100 picoseconds. So all of these intercollusional times are not the same either. However, you can always define an average time between collusions. Divide by the number of collusions, take the average time denoted by tau. You can always find an average collusional time tau. Okay? So if you focus your attention on a single electron, the average velocity of that single electron over time is zero. Correct? Any confusions? Now let's not talk about a single electron. Let's talk about many electrons. Now what you're doing, Hello. now what you're doing in this case is that you're looking at all of these electrons that I've highlighted here at one point in time. 
प्रीवियसली वी लुक एट द टाइम कोर्स ऑफ अ सिंगल इलेक्ट्रॉन ये बात समझ आ रही है ठीक है इंग्लिश समझ आई है टाइम कोर्स ऑफ अ सिंगल इलेक्ट्रॉन ठीक है पहले हमने क्या देखा एक इलेक्ट्रॉन पे अपनी तवज्जो रखी और देखा कि वो टाइम के साथ साथ उसकी वेलोसिटी वेक्टर्स किस तरह तब्दील हो रहे हैं फिर हमने उन ओवर टाइम एवरेज निकाला एंड दैट टर्न आउट टू बी जीरो नाउ व्हाट वी ट्राइंग टू डू इज वी टेक अ पिक्चर ऑफ दिस मेटल ऑफ ऑल द इलेक्ट्रॉन्स एट वन पॉइंट इन टाइम सो वी टेक अ स्नैप ऑफ मल्टीपल इलेक्ट्रॉन्स एट वन पॉइंट इन टाइम नाउ वी हैव मल्टीपल इलेक्ट्रॉन्स and if this camera is able to capture velocities at that instant in time all of these velocity vectors will be pointing in some random direction now if i take the average of these velocities at one point in time over multiple electrons what is this average going to be zero so the average velocity over time is zero of a single electron and so is the average velocity of multiple electrons at one point in time since both of them are zero there can be no current okay so current is really made by the electrons that pass through a plane at one point in time <coughs> since there are many electrons the average velocity over many electrons is also zero now what we've learned so far is the following let i'll come to this later okay now what i do next is i have the same metal and place it inside an electric field now the same metal with all its free electrons and all the ionic cores has been placed inside an electric field now the first question that comes to mind is that inside metals there can be no electric field okay because what really comes to mind is that all the charges will accumulate on the surface this metal will become polarized and it will be polarized in such a way that the electric field inside the metal has to be zero but that is only true for the case of electrostatic equilibrium if there is equilibrium then the electric field inside the metal has to be zero but when we talk about currents the conductor is not in a state of equilibrium the current is means that the conductor is out of electrostatic equilibrium so in conditions where the electrons are out of equilibrium only in those conditions can current flow so when we talk about currents the charges are not in equilibrium therefore the electric field inside the metal can be it has to be non zero and only a non zero electric field can give rise to a current as we'll show in a minute theek hai so current means that the metal is out of equilibrium now let's once again focus our attention on a single electron okay we just talking about a single electron there is some electric field inside the conductor because it's out of equilibrium now what's the force on this electron <coughs> 
if the electric field is E inside this at the position of this electron what's the force on this electron it's F E is minus E E correct so will this electron accelerate yes the acceleration of this electron is going to be Fe over m, the mass of the electron, it's going to be minus E over m, the charge to mass ratio of the electron into the electric field at the position of this electron. Okay. Now, let's consider the velocity of this electron. Is this acceleration uniform? Yes, if the electric field is not changing with time, the acceleration is uniform, which means that the velocity is changing linearly so with time if I focus on a single electron the velocity starts off at some value V naught and it increases linearly with time correct so the velocity of the electron at some point in time of the single electron on whose on whom we focus our attention with time this velocity is going to be the initial velocity some initial velocity of the electron plus the acceleration times time minus e m t e correct all right this is a vector equation. This is a velocity vector, an initial velocity, and an electric field. All three of these are vectors. Now, if I take the average of both sides, if I take this average velocity, if there were no electric field, this term would be zero. What would the average velocity at any time be equal to? Hmm? is the average of the initial velocities so what is the average initial velocity what is the initial velocity of the electron sorry all right now what's happening with the electron with time is that this single electron that started off here is changing its velocity vector upon every collision so here its initial velocity was in this direction it makes a collision it changes its velocity okay so with time it each electron has some initial velocity now if I take the average over multiple electrons I have to take the average initial velocity over multiple electrons minus each electron has the same charge, the same mass, the average time E average or E. The electric field is fixed. Okay. Does this equation make sense? Now if I am looking at multiple electrons, what is the average initial velocity of the electrons? Now, initial means I have to define some time axis. Where am I initiating my observation? Agreed? I have to talk about the time t equals zero. So when I'm looking at these electrons, I have to define where am I going to start my stopwatch. Okay? So I can start my stopwatch anywhere, any, at any point in time. It does not really matter. And if I look at multiple electrons, uh, I, at the point of collusion now at the point of collusion the electron can really have any velocity just because the collusion changes the direction of the electron so at the point of collusion just after the collusion the electron can start off with any velocity it likes look at this random motion this random walk this Brownian motion of the electron at the time at which a collusion occurs, a collusion occurs here, a collusion occurs here, a collusion occurs here, 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 here and so on.
So at these initial points at which the collision occurs, the velocity of that one electron could be pointing in random directions. Agreed? So for a single electron, the average initial velocity is zero. Okay, so this is again zero and we have minus E m the average time electric field. Now what is the average time we should take? We're talking about a single electron and we're starting our stopwatch at the time when a collusion has occurred. When the next collusion is going to occur, the stopwatch is going to start again. So, so our time has to be in between the two initiation initiations of the stopwatch it has to start at one collusion and it the limit of that time is before the second collusion occurs because when the second collusion occurs the velocity is reset again <coughs> okay so our time goes from zero the time of a collusion to the time at which the second the next collusion is going to occur and what is the average of that time it's just the average time between two collisions so I can replace this t, average t, by tau. But this is really a statistical argument. It's slightly profound and I know it's difficult to understand. So what we have at the end is that we have an average velocity of this single electron which is given by minus e over m, the average time between collisions, electric field. And things will be really clear if I draw a diagram. A graph between time and the velocity of the electrons. Yahan ta koi sawal, koi confusion zubara bata du. Is equation ki to samaj aagi hai na aapko. Rizwan aapko samaj aai hai? Aapko samaj aai hai? आपको जी नहीं आप बताएं आगे बैठे हैं आप बताएं आपको समझ आया जी 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 थोड़ी बहुत इस इक्वेशन तक समझ आ गई थी जी सर आपने बोला कि जब कलेशन स्टार्ट हो रही है तब हमारी टैक्टर स्टॉप पर स्टार्ट हो रही है सर हो रहा है कि उससे पहले वेलोसिटी का मैग्नीट्यूड तो होगा नहीं नहीं वेलोसिटी ये दीज़ आर इन एलास्टिक कुलुजन्स दीज़ आर इन एलास्टिक कुलुजन्स द वेलोसिटीज़ कैन आल्सो चेंज द स्पीड्स कैन चेंज द डायरेक्शंस कैन चेंज दे आर इन एलास्टिक कुलुजन्स रिमेम्बर व्हेन अ कुलुजन अकर्स देखो इसको इस अंदाज में देखो व्हेन अ कुलुजन अकर्स द इलेक्ट्रॉन Okay, the velocity of the electron just after the collision has nothing to do with the velocity of the electron before the collision. Every collision is resetting the electron. It's a nice way to understand. Every collision resets the electron. In other words, the memory of the electron is totally erased. You don't know what happened before the collision because the collision will give you a new initial velocity. That initial velocity could be any speed whatsoever. It could be in any direction whatsoever. So the average of those initial velocities, which are the velocities just after the collision, the average value of those initial velocities is zero. Because every collision is resetting the electron in a new state. The electron can go off in a new velocity and that velocity is totally random. And the average of a random is just zero. Okay? So this average velocity of the single electron is the time of, is the velocity of the electron just after the collision. That's zero. Okay, the average of it is zero. So what we left with is this term which is just the average velocity of the electron at any time is given by this e minus e over m into the average time and for the average time we take the average time between the collisions because this is the time scale 
which defines the average velocity this electron can acquire. If I take the maximum time here, it will define the maximum velocity this electron will acquire. But I don't know the maximum time because these times are distributed like a Gaussian function. These times are centered at some mean value. So if I put an average here, I get an average here. The average of this time is just the average time between collisions and that I've denoted by tau. And that's the property of the material. Okay, so if I were to plot the average velocity and I plot the magnitude of this average velocity, which is just the average speed with time, what kind of graph will I get? Just plot this, try to plot this graph. So this electron, I'm sorry, I'm quite disturbed by this microphone. It's not really... To speak really okay. What I want to plot is, I'm looking at one electron, I want to see how does its speed change with time. Remember that the single electron is undergoing multiple collisions in its course of time. So it starts off at some initial velocity, it increases its velocity and then it rebounces, it resets. So if you can make this plot, you will have understood my argument completely and fully. So just think about how do we make this plot. I would like to find out how does the speed change with time or for a single electron. Think about it. Average velocity will change. It depends upon this time. Should it decrease velocity because it is taking? No, it's taking longer it's taking between longer. collisions, right? So it's suffering less collisions per unit time. So the velocity it can acquire at the average of it is larger. The average speed average of a single electron, electron of one electron. Average. I mean, it's not the average speed; it's the speed, instantaneous the instantaneous speed of an electron. You're almost there. You're almost there. My friends is that after every talk, velocity should be gained. So I take the dawn and exact it. But these, so the collisions are not happening after every tau. They are happening after different time intervals. Is the time period here is smaller than the time period of one collision? It's larger. You do T and I is much larger than tau. G? Field on. Okay. Yeah, like like yeah, 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 like Really good. Okay. 
<laughs> it's almost there, but not not quite there. Excellent. Excellent. So there's one student who's actually done this correctly. Can you please raise your hand? Anyone else claims that he or she has could answer this question? All right. So what we have here, we're looking at a single electron. Okay. Now after after the collision, the electron can start off with any speed. Okay. Ranging from zero to this thermal speed, okay? This is just the thermal speed. The average speed just due to the thermal electrons. The electrons that are in thermodynamic equilibrium. Now what's happening in this case is the following. Suppose the electron starts off with the speed zero. Let's just suppose this, okay? So it's inside an electric field, its speed increases, it increases linearly. It undergoes a collision. Okay? Now when it undergoes a collision, it resets its speed. The new speed could be anything. It could be between zero, it could be zero or it could be it could be anything between zero and the thermal speed. Okay? So, <clears throat> if, if this point, it's not zero speed, I call this point V thermal. Okay? So this graph, this point is a thermal speed. Suppose the electron started off at the thermal speed. Okay, so with the presence of an electric field, its speed goes up, it goes beyond the thermal velocity and it undergoes a collusion. Now what happens is that after the collusion, the electron starts off in a new speed. The new speed could be anything between zero and the thermal speed. Okay, suppose it starts off here. Then after it has been reset, its initial velocity is slightly higher than the thermal velocity because the thermal velocity is an average anyway. So it starts accelerating and the slope of this line is still the same because the acceleration is the same. Now after a certain period of time, let's call this time T1, let's call this time T2, it resets again. Now it starts off with some speed that is smaller than the thermal velocity and it starts accelerating again. Now there's a longer time period between the next collision. So there is some time T3 here. So if I make a bigger graph, this is what it will look like. I have V average. This is V thermal. This is what this graph will look like. And the time between these collisions is T1, T2, T3. It's non-uniform. Sometimes collisions occur rapidly, sometimes they take longer. I mean this is just it it's It's just reset here, okay? It's not going to slope downward, it's just a resetting operation that's occurring here. It's a discontinuous function because it's a collision. G. Sorry? 
कोई पैटर्न रिपीट नहीं होगा इट्स टोटली रैंडम सॉरी ग्रेडियंट इज गोइंग टू बी द सेम फॉर ऑल बिकॉज द एक्सेलरेशन इज द सेम ओके सो इन द नेक्स्ट क्लास वी गोइंग टू हैव अ क्विज एंड वी गोइंग टू बिल्ड अप दिस डिस्कशन नेक्स्ट मंडे ड्यूरिंग द रेसिटेशन टाइम ऑल राइट सो सी यू ऑन फ्राइडे विद द क्विज